you everyone for joining us for this NAC at home program. My name is Mitch Case and I'm with the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public. This includes exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings, and more. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as YouTube. If you are interested in becoming a member of the NAC or would like more information, please reach out to admissions at the nationalartsclub.org. I'm now going to share a message from Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, chair of the club's archeology span committee. Thank you, Mitch, and good afternoon, everyone. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, Chair of the Archaeology Committee, and delighted to welcome today's global audience to an extraordinary program presented in collaboration with the American Research Center in Egypt's New York chapter. A special thank you to Stephanie Dankowitz, who has worked with the Archaeology Committee on this lecture. 18th Dynasty Hatshepsut, daughter of Pharaoh Thutmose I, wife of Thutmose II, stepmother and aunt of Thutmose III, with whom she reigned as both co-regent and co-ruler, Hatshepsut intrigues. She had constructed perhaps more edifices than any other pharaoh and encouraged trading with fabled lands such as Punt. Yet many of her monuments were destroyed, defaced, reused by subsequent rulers commencing blatantly with Thutmose III, also known as the Napoleon of Egypt, to such an extent that she was mostly a non-entity to Egyptian historians, and her name doesn't appear in most king lists, only to be rediscovered in the mid-19th century. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Betsy Bryan the past president of Aussie, as well as the Alexander Baudry Professor of Egyptian Art and Archaeology at John Hopkins University. An internationally renowned scholar specializing in the New Kingdom and Hatshepsut in particular, she excavated at the fascinating Temple of Mutt, the subject of today's lecture over the course of the last 20 years. Incidentally, Betsy was traveling in Egypt this past April 3rd, when the glorious Pharaoh's Golden Parade took place, which included the remains of Hatshepsut among those of 22 pharaohs and queens, which were transported to the new National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. And where was Professor Bryan that day? commemorating Hatshepsut in her own way by enjoying the magisterial beauties of her mortuary temple at Dal al -Bari, which magically, splendidly, seems to emerge directly out of the rugged cliffs behind. Betsy, if you will. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I am uh, coming to you from the uh, usually beautiful um, Virgin Islands, American Virgin Islands. And um, although everything is fine right now, um, earlier today we did have uh, a power outage. So I just hope that we will get through all of this without that recurrence. And I uh, deeply apologize in case it does happen. I will try and use my mobile network if that does occur. So uh, in any case, um, I think we should get started um, right away when, and uh, I will share my screen. Um, so uh, as Michelle said, um, the Johns Hopkins University has been uh, working at the Temple of Moot since 2001. So it is 20 years uh, this year. Um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, we are now joined by uh, Liverpool University um, and by Professor Violaine Chauvet, who uh, has been co-director for quite a few years and will be, um, as I 
begin to recede a bit, uh, we'll be taking over as director in another year or so, uh, a, a sole director. So um, you're looking at the peninsula um, at the temple of Mut. Um, the precinct of the goddess Mut is actually usually called South Karnak. It is part of the Karnak temples um, together with the central temple, which is of course devoted to the god Amun-Re and was his principal seat for thousands of years um, as the great national god of Egypt. Um, Northern Karnak um, is devoted to the god Mantu, but um, also had other deities associated. And the Southern uh, precinct of, is for the goddess Mut, who, um, is recognized in Karnak in particular as the consort of the god Amun-Re, that is the wife and the mother of their offspring, uh, Kansu, the moon god. Um, in the earlier years, as our research has demonstrated, um, in the, the Middle Kingdom and in the early New Kingdom, um, the goddess Mut was not so much associated uh, with Amun-Re of Karnak. And I'll explain why uh, in a little bit. Um, but instead was very much a one of the so-called Uraeus goddesses who were the daughters or agents of the sun god Ray um, and did his bidding on earth, um, sometimes uh, particularly moot, took the form of a, a lion headed goddess. And in that uh, particular form, she often uh, would punish those who rebelled um, against the god. Uh, it was only slowly that she was transformed more or less into the goddess um, who was seen as the mistress of heaven um, and the wife uh, of Amun Re. So um, I'd like to get started and we focus today on Hatshepsut, the, the ruler, and also the Temple of Mut, but starting really um, with Hatshepsut herself. Oh dear. Okay. So I think when you think of Hatshepsut, the first thing you think of is of course her beautiful Temple of Deir al-Bahri, which was on the one hand a mortuary temple, but certainly uh, on the second, third, fourth, and fifth hands um, had so many other functions that um, continued uh, to exist, not only in her time, but in uh, the thousands of years of, uh, of Egypt's ancient history um, after her time. Um, and on the left-hand side, we had a... Um, uh, there is actually the temple to the goddess um, Hathor is also located um, on the southern side of Hatshepsut's uh, temple. And Hathor, of course, is in many ways a counterpart to the goddess Mut, um, which I will revisit um, in a bit. Now, you can't really talk about the beginning of the time of Hatshepsut without really thinking about um, what came immediately in front of her. Michelle mentioned the fact that Hatshepsut was uh, the, the daughter of Thutmose I uh, and the wife of Thutmose II. Now Thutmose II um, was, his, the length of his reign is really quite difficult to determine. We don't know with certainty how long he was on the throne. Um, and we don't actually have a large a number of original monuments in his name. Um, he, he was, uh, we see the, the ones I show you here actually are, this is a statue um, that comes from Elephantine, an island in Aswan that shows him in the said festival garment um, and wearing the white crown. Uh, many people would in fact doubt that he actually ruled long enough to celebrate a said festival. He nonetheless appears here in this statue in that which is a very traditional pose for kings. On the right, 
there is a kneeling figure um, from Karnak of uh, Thutmose II uh, making a, an offering of wine to um, Amun Re. And um, this is among the this is among the objects that do seem to bear his name in an original sense. But in fact, there are far more that bear his name that actually were not original to him because um, on the one hand, Hatshepsut, in a sense, utilized her husband, who was also her half brother, of course, towards the end of his life, beginning to build monuments um, at Karnak Temple, naming both him and her um, but he was almost certainly very much on the way out, even at the time that these buildings were being created. Um, and they, she continued to finish them. And even as she did that, keeping him in the picture, added elements to her own images to transform herself slowly but surely into the ruler rather than a queen. Of course, she was in fact a queen and the wife of Amun, and that was her primary role um, for many years. Now, we see this kind of replacement um, all over the place, even here at the Mook Temple, which is, we have a gateway, which is built by Hatshepsut during her, co her co-regency with uh, Thutmose III. And um, on the left jam, her name had been written as Ma'at Kare, her prenomen, uh, followed by uh, the name Hatshepsut. And it has been transformed to read A'a Keper Enre, which is the prenomen of Thutmose II, and then following that, Thutmose. The right jam still maintains the remains uh, of the original name of Thutmose the third, Menkeper Kare, uh, Thutmose, uh, uh, on, as just as you see it here. In fact, it's interesting that the writing's gate uh, is identical to the writing of Thutmose the third's two cartouche names on a column that we discovered um, at the Mook Temple itself, dating, of course to that co-regency. Now, this is how we think about Hatshepsut most commonly when we start to talk about how she transformed herself. We think of her as moving from having been a female, um, a gendered female uh, ruler into slowly but surely a male ruler who at first had sort of female elements, but then uh, male ones. The writing uh, of pronouns in association with Hatshepsut uh, did also show uh, variation, sometimes female, sometimes male, sometimes both. Um, but this is actually only a, a portion of the story because this actually reflects these issues only the time after she is already declared herself to be a ruler having taken on the regalia of kingship. Um, and that means not only that, not only the regalia, but also the titles uh, and cartouche names. So in fact, at Karnak, there's a much better record of how she went about this. And it bears on uh, her work at Moot because I think I can say safely say and tell you that um, everything that we have uh, excavated at uh, the Moot Temple coming from the time of Hatshepsut belongs to the true co-regency period between her and Thutmose III. But there is an earlier period that we could call the Regency where she is still depicted um, as a queen and the God's wife of Amun and has been entrusted um, as regent over Thutmose III at the time of the death of her husband, Thutmose II. But as I said, she was building these monuments together with Thutmose II and continued to build them, it appears, or at least certainly continued to alter them and leave them in place briefly um, after he had passed away. 
So um, on one of these monuments that we see, um, that we're looking at here, we have a, a representation of her as a queen, and she is being given life and dominion by the god Seth um, on her left and by the goddess Nephthys um, behind her. And she is identified as the god's wife of Amun in this scene. But interestingly, this comes from a building that was uh, of limestone that she uh, was putting putting up towards the end of her husband's reign. Um, and the opposite side of this same monument, the facing scene, um, shows him, shows Thutmose II having his crowns conferred by um, Osiris and Isis. So you have him receiving his crowns from Osiris and Isis and Osiris, and we have her receiving life and dominion from Seth and Nephthys. And this is by no means an accident at all. The map you see in between indicates where in that green, where these particular new limestone monuments had been, they were then taken down and new ones built by Hatshepsut herself. Um, but um, it is by no means an accident that we have these deities represented because of course these are the Heliopolitan gods and they represent the brother sister marriage of the gods in the same way that Hatshepsut and Thutmose II represented brother sister marriage. And that in fact, with the same level of strength and power that she would like to have recognized. Indeed, on this, um, there is this monument, which we know from inscriptions is named Necheri Menu. Um, and he, on that limestone monument, we find her shown uh, as the queen, she's identified in the inscriptions, and behind her is her daughter by Thutmose II, Nefru Ray, who is now taking over as God's wife of Amun in this particular image. But an addition was made on this monument, as I've already implied, after it was completed, um, there is the arrow pointing to a cartouche inside of which is the new throne name, the new prenomen name of Hatshepsut as Matka Re. And behind it or beneath it, you see an ostrich band. These are indicators of the presence of the royal Ka. And it is not, again, an accident that this fan is there to remind us that Hatshepsut is not only queen as she appears to the right, but she is actually ruler and is developing herself as such. Now the person who was responsible for the Karnak monuments primarily um, of uh, Hatshepsut during this time period was the high priest of Amun, Hapu Seneb. And this is a statue of him that's in the Louvre. Um, in fact, it is on that statue that we learn from him himself that he directed the work um, for the Necheri Menu uh, uh, monument and says, I oversaw the erection of a shrine of fine white limestone of highest quality named Matkare is divine of monuments, which is what Necheri Menu means. And we've, he actually oversaw the creation of quite a large number um, of monuments and objects um, on behalf of uh, Hatshepsut um, for the Karnak temple. It's important to remember him because he's going to turn up, not surprisingly, at the temple of Mut um, as well. <clears throat> and if you look carefully at the scene um, uh, here, we have Thutmose the second, um, who is moving um, to the left and behind him had been the image of Hatshepsut as queen. But in a remodeling that took place uh, probably after his uh, demise, um, her Matkare cartouche has been added. Her wig has been turned into um, the Nemi's headdress 
and whatever she was holding in her near arm is now the crook, the crook of rulership. So we see her developing, and again, once more, the ostrich fan behind all of these elements reminding us that this is uh, the ruler in making. Now, <clears throat> Hepicena was very active throughout, and one of the places that was an important part of Karnak Temple um, at this early part of the 18th dynasty was the so-called Wajit Hall that was associated with Hatshepsut's father, that most first. Uh, it's where her great obelisk that people visit when they go to uh, Karnak uh, is located. And, um, and uh, but Hepicenep actually made an addition um, alongside or on behalf of the queen uh, at this place. And you see it just a little bit on the right hand side. Um, they're now located behind the great pillars that held uh, Osiride statues of Thutmose the first, but it's a series of Osiride statues of Hatshepsut, much, much smaller, uh, in a seated form and um, in an almost mummy kind of uh, representation. Now, one of the things that's quite interesting to bear in mind is here's a close up on the right of one of these Osiris of Hatshepsut. And on the left is a statue of Hapusena, now in the Bologna Museum. And it would be hard not to come to the conclusion that there's a intentionality between the particular way in which he has chosen to have himself presented so that he can in almost take credit for the Karnak Osiris of Hatshepsut um, by just simply appearing as he does. <clears throat> of course, we know that this kind of um, emulation and taking of royal prerogatives was something that Sen and Moot is extremely well known for. Um, but it does appear that uh, others of the close code had ships that maybe very well have been doing the same. <clears throat> now, as time goes on, and we're talking about a period um, that ends probably in year seven of Thutmose the third's reign, but must have lasted several years at least. Um, we see Hatshepsut moving from represented uh, purely as a queen uh, to her being shown as you see her here on the left, uh, wearing royal wig, a round wig associated with kings um, and the, uh, the headdress uh, with plumes uh, and, and uh, ram's horns, um, making a, a, uh, an offering. Um, to uh, to the god Amun um, Ray, so she is uh, slowly but surely um, represented uh, in such a way that um, uh, that her kingship becomes clearer and clearer. Now, <clears throat> sometime um, exactly the date would be hard to say. She did make the decision to be much more open about her being in co-regency with Thutmose III, no longer regent to him, but actually sharing the throne with him. And when she did that, she also began to dismantle the limestone monuments that she had been building um, and replace them uh, with sandstone uh, temples and shrines and uh, monuments of other materials, such as, of course, her famous quartzite, red, a red quartzite chapel uh, in the center of Karnak. <clears throat> now, during the entirety of the rest of the co-regency, which lasted from at least year seven until around year 20, we have uh, that most the third is uh, clearly always there. Sometimes the monuments are actually dated. Um, and naming both of them. Um, sometimes um, she is alone, but in all cases, he would be the lesser, um, Im less important of the two, such as you see here on this quartzite block um, from, the <clears throat> from her uh, Karnak shrine, where you see her very actively in the process of consecrating uh, boxes of linen uh, while he stands rather uh, solidly and uh, silently almost um, uh, 
behind her uh, and support it. Now that sort of gives us an introduction to what had gone on before Hatshepsut began to work at the Moot Temple. So now we can begin to look uh, at that monument, which uh, must have begun to be built perhaps somewhere after year seven, could have been however as early uh, as year eight or nine <clears throat> based on uh, the material we have. Now, <clears throat> here's a Google image, of course, um, of the uh, precinct of, the, of Moot. And as you see, it is a sort of um, almost horseshoe shaped uh, lake. The lake actually gives its name to the site, which is called Isharu. So Moot is called the Lady of Isharu. The Moot Temple is on a peninsula um, that actually is surrounded by this horseshoe shaped lake. Um, and um, the, the arrow that you see here points to the gate that I showed you an image of earlier for the time of Hatshepsut's rule, the Western entryway into the Moot precinct. Now that's important because the Mood Precinct actually grew to be much, much larger and you can sort of see outlines uh, around the image uh, with the Sphinx alleys riding, coming right up um, to the entryways. So the time of the early 18th dynasty, the, the size of the Mood Precinct was considerably smaller. Um, and however, it was uh, enclosed uh, with a mud brick wall that had this stone gate, uh, which you see in the inset um, from the co-regency of Thutmose III and, Amun, and uh, Hatshepsut. So it's rather odd for us to see an entryway on the west when we think that the Moot Temple is actually uh, oriented north and south. Um, here's a, another image. Um, it's almost impossible to see now, but on the inside jam uh, thickness of this uh, gateway, there actually is the cartouche um, of Mat Kare, and there is also a cutout where Senen Moot had depicted himself. Here is the outline um, of that 18th dynasty precinct. Um, in the time of Hatshepsut. So we can actually follow it quite well by we, act, we excavated the mud brick wall so that we could actually be pretty clear about what the size of the precinct was um, in the time of Hatshepsut. But why was it, uh, a, there was, why was there a Western gate and why was the precinct so much smaller? Um, and this is answered by the, the actual way in which um, most temple areas were created in, in Egypt, and that was by the action of the Nile River. Uh, the Nile um, is a large uh, river that does move from time to time, and as it moves, it creates small branches, and those branches then eventually cut off land and um, more silt from the river is deposited that builds up islands inside um, of the, the flowing river itself. And you can see that on this Google image where there are in fact islands being created all the time uh, in the Nile by just this kind of action. The, uh, the creation of such islands we see here in a, a fairly recent example when the Nile silt is coming downstream, um, it comes from south to north, of course, um, something slows it down, whatever, and it dumps silt uh, that then builds up. And what happens is that as an island begins to form, uh, the largest amount of that uh, pileup of dirt happens at the up uh, end of the uh, upstream end uh, of a forming island. So that tends to be the higher ground. And then it sort of forms around that and can sometimes be also rather heavy towards the end of that island. But the center of these new forming islands is very boggy uh, and tends to be watery much, much longer. Um, and 
Um, what we have found over time is that when you study Egyptian temples and do the kind of coring that is necessary, you learn that almost all of them actually um, have been formed out of islands that were created uh, in just this way. Uh, we know that the Temple of Karnak um, was on such an island that, that um, and what you're seeing here is the outlines that were roughly represented by the time of the 11th dynasty around, two, excuse me, 2000 BC. Uh, the river bank um, would actually have been here along the right end uh, of that uh, island layout. Let me see if I can get the laser pointer here. So along in here. Now here is the island uh, representing uh, the Moot precinct. And as you can see, there's something between them. In fact, this is much lower level, land, uh, low lying land. And indeed there was in fact water there um, through the year. Um, probably uh, even the surmise is that it may even have been at some parts of the year in the time of Hatshepsut that it was, if not underwater, that it was quite marshy and watery. Um, and therefore these two islands were actually quite separate areas. And that is a lot to explain why the Moot goddess um, of Moot Temple was by no means naturally assimilated to the god Amun-Re uh, in the early period from of the Middle Kingdom and the early uh, New Kingdom. They were in fact on separate islands and separated by water uh, much of that time. Uh, but eventually the land did come together and that is when you begin to see them build slowly but surely these sphinx alleys that connect them for processional purposes. Um, and, but at the same time, if you look, the outline here is going to be very close to where there would have been uh, a Western uh, entrance gate that we've already seen um, for, at the time of Hatshepsut. That Western gate very likely is the leftover um, from a time where the riverbank was nearby and, and the access was on the West when one wanted to come in by boat uh, to the Moot precinct. <clears throat> so from what we can tell, although there was a temple um, at Moot um, in the Middle Kingdom and in the second intermediate period, they were of mud brick and Hatshepsut and that Moses III appeared to have been the first rulers ever to build there in stone. Uh, and that is what we have been uh, looking at in our excavations. So <clears throat> the, uh, we found that there are at least two stages of work by Hatshepsut at the Moot Temple. The first represented her building limestone monuments, just as she had done uh, at Karnak. Um, and the second where she was building in sandstone. Now at Karnak, as I've said to you, she took everything down, swept it away and rebuilt um, altogether um, in, uh, in the new stone material. Um, at the Moot Temple, she doesn't seem to have done that. And it's a very unusual situation, which I'll get to uh, very, very soon. But there are players here who are very important and they're the same people that were active for Hatshepsut uh, elsewhere. Um, Senenmut, of course, um, was uh, without any doubt, he was the steward of Amun, but he was without any doubt her primary architect and oversight for all activities, um, which doesn't mean that people like Hapu Seneb um, were not able to, to take great responsibility, but Senenmut almost certainly had uh, more access than anyone else. In fact, the statue that he left at the Moot Temple, uh, which is in the Cairo Museum, or at least it was the last time I saw it, um, is a absolutely magnificent quartzite statue um, that is uh, over one and a half meters in height. And as a, a, a 
a kneeling Neophor statue where he's holding uh, an image, a, an emblem um, of the goddess Hathor in front of him. And it is by far and away the largest of the statues left by officials from this 18th dynasty period. In general, the, Hatch, the Mut temple is quite small in comparison to the Karnak temple. And so the statuary made for it was likewise quite small, um, generally no, no more than a meter uh, in height. And so the fact that, that uh, Sen and Mut had this quite large statue um, is an indicator, of course, um, of his preeminence uh, in the environment. But I think it's also important to note that the lengthy inscription that he put on it was very intentional on his part to list exactly the areas that Hatshepsut had put him in charge of in terms of monuments. And he listed um, Daryl Bahri first, uh, he listed uh, Karnak, and he listed the Pair Moot, the, the temple uh, of, of Moot, um, uh, as all these places that he was very involved with. But he also went on to talk uh, rather a great deal here about his involvement with the goddess Hathor, because in bringing in Daryl Bahri, he was stressing the fact that there was a connection cultically between the temple of this goddess Mut and the temple of Hathor um, at Dar el Bahri. And I'll come back to that very briefly in a minute. So here's a, the text actually that refers to him as the director of works in Karnak and Southern Heliopolis, which is probably in Karnak, um, in Amun, Jezer, Jezeru, in the Pyramut, and in the Southern Ipet, which is Luxor Temple. Now, another person who was extremely important um, for the Temple of Mut in the time was the second priest of Amun, Puyem Re. Now, he lasted through Hatshepsut and well into the time of Thutmose III, and he built his tomb uh, in Thebes. And actually, by that time, Thutmose III is the primary uh, person named uh, on his monuments. But on this statue, he actually takes responsibility um, for having seen, overseen the erection um, of shrines uh, in good limestone of the highest quality by the queen, uh, dual king, Mat Kaire, for her mother, Mut, the mistress of Isheru. And then he says that he oversaw the erection of a pear ware, which is a style of shrine, out of ebony, worked in electrum uh, by the dual king Matkare for her mother Mut, the mistress of Isheru. So we see Pui Emre here um, taking responsibility for the oversight of buildings made of limestone at Mut, uh, as well as a pearware shrine that would have gone inside of them. Now, when we go to visit at the Temple of Mood, even before we began work there uh, 20 years ago, the, one of the things you see right away are the roots a limestone shrine of Hatshepsut's, what is, which is still in situ. It was cut away, and we know now that it was cut away almost certainly in the Ptolemaic period, um, but had probably stood uh, up until that time to some extent, or at least had been tolerated. Maybe something had been placed over top of it. Um, <clears throat> now, our work when we arrived um, was to try and make a little more sense out of what we saw left in this rather messy looking um, uh, temple of Mut. And one of the places that we decided to work, um, if you consider that the, uh, the limestone building uh, shrine of Hatshepsut is right back here, uh, we decided that we would try and fix this wall. And when we did that, we excavated in the room directly behind it. Uh, almost immediately, uh, we found underneath the foundation that was, a, uh, was created out of limestone blocks naming Hatshepsut uh, and sandstone columns also naming Hatshepsut. Um, the limestone blocks um, come from a, one of these shrines um, and the entranceway to one of these shrines. 
Um, and on one side of the doorway, um, there was um, Hatshepsut um, in front of the goddess Mut. That was the, on the one on the left. And on the right hand side, uh, the lower part is unfortunately not in good condition, um, was the most the third uh, offering in front uh, of Mut. <clears throat> and in, in all cases, she is actually referred to as, um, as Moot, the lady uh, of the pair, mistress of the pair wear, uh, as well as, of course, she's called Moot Bastet um, here, referring strongly to her lion form. Uh, here's a reconstruction um, of, from the blocks that we have um, of, uh, of what this shrine would have looked like in limestone with the torus molding and cavetto cornice. Um, and you have um, the, uh, the ruler on either side. It's about a, a five meters in height, um, this image. Then the inner thickness you see Hatshepsut again offering in front um, um, of the goddess Mut uh, far on the right. <clears throat> now hidden inside um, of this, uh, on the opposite side of this inner jam from, uh, from this image um, is a representation of uh, of none other than Senen Moot himself, um, who is usually hiding inside of doorways. Uh, we only have the back of his wig and his shoulder, so he would have had his arms up uh, in adoration, very likely, but he would have been kneeling. And so he was, in fact, as he is on so many places uh, in Dero Bahri, um, hiding but worshiping his, uh, his queen. Now we also found um, looking around for what happened to all the remains of this, these limestone chapels, uh, we found that a Ptolemaic shrine in the front of Moot, which is actually in the Brooklyn Museum's um, concession, uh, that there are, were limestone or there are limestone blocks uh, that derive from one of these shrines. And so here you see uh, Will Shank, the artist, um, uh, drawing those uh, the a bit of that relief um, decoration um, so that we could try and uh, include it. And this is what uh, he came up with. These represent the exterior um, of, uh, of one of these shrines. Um, and you saw that there's actually a cabeta, a, a torus molding here um, at that corner. So we have that to add, it's not a great deal, but it, uh, it represents uh, a little bit. And um, so now we can begin to talk a little bit about what existed at the time that Hatshepsut was working. Now, one of the things we can say um, is that there were almost certainly three originally, three of these limestone, limestone shrines um, and um, there also were, was probably a, uh, a, a room that ran north south, oh, excuse me, east west um, in, in its direction um, behind those shrines. Um, and unfortunately, uh, very little is left of them, but there are uh, indications of what they might have looked like. So one always tries to think about how do you reconstruct what the floor plan would have been like um, for these, uh, these shrines and their operation um, at, in, the, uh, in her time. Um, these are several Thutmuzid um, uh, temples of the time of Hatshepsut represented in floor plan. Uh, the bright colored one is a new one produced by Francois Larcher. Um, who is reconstructing the Necheri menu um, of Hatshepsut, um, which he places on both the north and the south southern sides of the central bark shrine, which uh, was also in hard limestone at that time. Um, on the top left, this is the floor plan of the small temple at Medinet Habu, um, which is from the co-regency period originally. And on the to the right of that is the floor plan of the uh, temple of Satis at Elephantine. 
<clears throat> but the one that is the closest and has remained the closest all through uh, throughout uh, is Hatshepsut's temple at Buhan in Nubia, which is uh, at the second cataract, um, was built at the second cataract in the fortress of Buhan. Um, it's now in Khartoum in the museum for those of you who want to go visit it. Um, and it's quite a, a fascinating uh, small temple on its own. That size of that temple, if you took away the porch, which is this section, um, it's much squarer and similar to the outlines um, of the actual um, platform of Hatshepsut um, at, uh, at, at Moot Temple, which is banded really by exactly what I have laid out here in pavement. Um, and um, you'll notice that on the Moot Temple's uh, outline of its pavement, there's a little circle and there's another one at that corner. And you'll see that it parallels the little circles that you see uh, at the corner on the Buhan Temple. That is the Cavetto Cornice excuse me, the Taurus molding where it um, would have, uh, have reached the ground. And on this uh, temple um, at Moot, there are dotted lines on the uh, pavement. Uh, this was beautifully done by uh, William Peck. Um, and um, the dotted lines indicate that there actually are true cut lines on the platform that indicate where walls um, may have gone. So there's no certainty about how these walls operated, but there is some indication um, that the Buhan Temple uh, is a likely uh, uh, model for us to look at. And if you just put in um, the three limestone shrines in front, um, the one here on the east side probably had an entryway um, that faced towards the west. Uh, the central shrine may very well have been the one that we have blocks from, but it may be that we had them from here. Um, and behind it, quite possibly, there is a corridor and an entryway into a transverse type, uh, type hall. <clears throat> Now, again, this is how these limestone shrines would have looked. And I would propose to say that it's quite possible that for at least seven or eight years of the time of the co-regency, um, the Moot Temple looked like a limestone uh, set of shrines um, as its primary, uh, as the primary temple, although it would have been fronted um, by columns, uh, the columns that we found um, in our, uh, our excavations. Now, later in the co-regency, uh, in the same time that she was building uh, in sandstone, Hatshepsut seems to have decided to do likewise uh, at the Moot Temple. And um, the first indications we had for that um, is that even the front wall of the porch is made of reused sandstone square piers um, of Hatshepsut in front of the goddess Moot. Now, every time we began to carefully examine the blocks that we have excavated here, we have found that the name of Hatshepsut has in most cases, but not all, um, has been replaced um, by that of Thutmose III. So in other words, the sandstone blocks and sandstone square piers do represent the time of the co-regency of Hatshepsut with Thutmose III. <clears throat> and so the columns could were then uh, made up of um, a variety of, uh, of types, but the primary ones are simple fluted um, uh, columns that, and two of them had Hathoric heads on them at the time uh, of uh, Hatshepsut's reign. These are square pillars um, pieces that are in the process of being uh, conserved as we began to excavate them. 
Um, these are, are, this is where we now store a lot of the larger stone and we are in the process of doing photogrammetry so that we can actually do a three dimensional reconstruction um, with the great wonderful help um, of David Anderson, the present president of the American Research Center in Egypt. So just a few of the things that indicate the time of this co-regency in sandstone. This is a lintel that would have been a major doorway. And you have two stacks of cartouches. They're both the most the third from this left. But if you can tell, running to the right is completely mutilated. And that's because this lintel had had Shepset uh, on the right-hand side and uh, the, most of third's name uh, on the left-hand side. Same is true of this doorway piece where on the left-hand side, we had uh, the most of third's name and on the right-hand side, the, um, had Shepset's name. Now this same phenomenon took place at the Buhen temple um, where they used all different kinds of ways to remove her name in the time that the most the third carried out his proscription of Hatshepsut. Um, sometimes they carved it out and filled it with plaster. Sometimes th they would then could then carve into the plaster. Sometimes they would dig it out even more into a niche and then take a whole new piece of stone and install it in with the new representation. Uh, and they seem to have used all of these same possibilities um, at the Mu temple when they did this. Now, another thing to bear in mind about what we found of these sandstone blocks, they're, they're approximately 70 to 90 centimeters uh, in length and their depth is about the same. So they're very large squarish blocks and they're decorated on both sides. Now, here is an example of one where the, it comes from a scene where it shows Montu um, actually escorting the king in front of the deities. Um, and on the opposite side is once again, the ruler, oh dear, sorry. <laughs> um, the ruler being behind what used to be the goddess Moot. Her wig has been completely uh, obliterated um, during the Amarna period by Akhenaten's people. But you'll notice that in both of these cases, we have raised relief. All of these sandstone blocks that we have found um, from the time of Hatshepsut and Thutmose III co-regency are in raised relief. And in raised relief is an indicator that there was some kind of roofing over the portion that faced outside. Um, and so that's again, some kind of a help to us uh, to think about what the architecture of this building might've been like. Some of the other kinds of scenes that we have, we had the, the we have had Shepsut running in front of the gods to prove um, her capability. Uh, and uh, here we have her uh, in front of the deity. And in this particular instance, um, the her name has been completely replaced. You might even be able to see yourselves how wonky the writing of this Senate board's elements are. It's very poorly redone. And where her name had been the pronoun S for she, they've turned it into a very badly done snake, which is for the male he. <clears throat> and here's another couple of examples I was talking about where you cut out the entirety of her element of her image uh, and then fill it in uh, with another piece. This is the Buhan example of doing that. And this is the Moot Temple example of doing that. The square pillars, um, we believe now that we have probably four complete ones and maybe one engaged one um, so that um, it would have looked a little bit like Dero Bahri, which you see here on the right. Um, but it could also, I think, look more like the small temple of Medinet Habu uh, if we were just looking uh, at its porch where you see an engaged column up against walls on the side. So I think that if you were to think about the Mut temple in the co-regency um, time of Hatshepsut, um, it would be 
this would be very good as an analogy for how it may have looked. But one of the things to bear in mind is that inside of there were still the limestone shrines that she had erected earlier. They were not dismantled as they had been done at Karnak, but rather they had a porch wrapped around them. Um, and in fact, these columns that we have found in 2004, all the way up until 2007, seem to have perhaps played a part in this as well. The columns are well known to people now because they are actually, six of them actually name the Festival of Drunkenness or the Hall of Drunkenness. Uh, and I suspect now that I can suggest that they probably all of those um, come from the western side um, of the uh, of the temple, uh, and the other ones probably came uh, from the eastern side. Um, we know that there was uh, the the temple did was a site of the celebration of the festival of drunkenness. Underneath one of those columns, we actually even found a drinking cup. Um, that dates exactly from the time uh, of Hatshepsut's reign. Um, and the high priest of Amun, Hapu Senab, actually left on the statue that he dedicated for Mut there. He actually made it clear uh, on that statue's inscription um, that he was very much connected with that festival and its celebration as a means of associating Hathor with and um, Hathor and Moot and asking for protection for the goddess uh, for the queen um, in, in uh, during this time of the festival of drunkenness. So I'm going to move down and to show us that these this is what the columns look like now. Um, we have re-erected them all in front of the temple simply to give you some sense of height because all that remains in the rest of the temple is uh, foundations. Um, but this is not how we understand. I expect that being closer to a configuration that looked like this originally in the time of Hatshepsut's so some a rain where we had at the entrance facing the entrance there would have been a row of square piers and two uh, columns with Hathoric um, capitals on them uh, in the center and a row of columns probably associated with the drunkenness festival um, on uh, on the west side um, and a row um, on the other side, on the east. And you'll notice that this left this back part open. And um, I have nothing to suggest uh, at this point that there were um, actually uh, more columns uh, in the rear. The green line indicates what we're proposing is the place of surrounding the limestone shrines that would have been one, two, three across here. Um, with the sandstone blocks, creating new walls. Um, oh, and actually I've made a terrible mistake here. I apologize, because I was doing this right before <laughs> I came on here. The green line should be inside. I apologize deeply because the columns surrounded the sandstone walls. Um, I'll adjust this and I do apologize for that. So we had um, sandstone walls that wrapped around limestone shrines. We had columns outside of those that supported um, a, a sort of temporary or porch-like roof um, the, for a peristyle that allowed for the sandstone relief to be in raised relief um, on the sides of the temple. And then of course we had our square pillars uh, in the front. And this is just to remind us of all the people who in, were involved uh, in this building of this temple for Hatshepsut. Senen Mood, of course, the director of all these works, and Hepu Senab, who certainly seems to have been very active, not only building for her at Karnak, but 
in celebrating um, at her festivals of drunkenness that um, were designed not only to connect her to Hathor, but also in some ways to actually invoke punishment to people who were disobedient to Hatshepsut, as I've written about uh, in our Cultic Revelries uh, volume. And finally, Puyam Ray, who tells us that he actually oversaw the building of these limestone shrines uh, that we saw. Uh, and that is the end for me. And thank you very, very much. Well, it's the time that I return now, Betsy, and I want to thank you for this absolutely splendid talk. I knew it would be. I had no doubt, but it exceeded what I was hoping for. So you've given us such a wonderful insight into Hatshepsut, really the different phases of her life, into the buildings connected with her, the relationship to others surrounding. Um, I know we've, our time is a little pressed. No, I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled. Uh, so I'm gonna do my conclusion right now so we can do the questions. Instead of, I see that some people have to go back to work. So for those who were interested in cinema, may I just mention that the Brooklyn Museum has a wonderful image of him. So you can see that in New York. And I, someone asked if the Temple of Mutt is open to the public. I know I've gone to Cinemutt's too. It is. Also. So I, I wanted to mention that right now. So all of you, your learning is definitely not over. You have great opportunities in front of you. But talking about that, you brought up the interesting issues of geology. I just want our audience to know, not only was some of that new for me, and I've shared it with a number of people since and some well-known archeologists, but on November 10th, we are actually gonna have a program about geology and archeology span with committee member, Stephen Picard, who teaches Great. at Queens College. I don't know what he'll be talking about yet. I will, as time goes on. So I invite you all, it will be given live at the club. The club is opening to the public again in September. And our first lecture for the committee relates to Betsy, because it's gonna be with Stephen Vinson, whom I met through Betsy, was one of, <laughs> I think your first PhD student. And she'll be talking about the club's theme, the new technologies, new technologies in Egypt. And we do have our last online program, which will be on July the um, 15th, and that's with Alain Zivi on Amon and Art. So I welcome you. Betsy, as always, sets the standard. And there's a reason why <laughs> she was the past president of Aussie and so much else. So I thank you, Betsy, very much. It really has been wonderful. And the comments say that as well. Uh, and I thank the audience has, who has remained with us to this point, I'd like to go to some questions. And I have some first from the committee, if I may. Um, there were some women who, ex who were involved with the Mud Temple. And these were fascinating people. And this comes from Lynn, the co-chair. And they were Maggie Benson and Nettie Gormley. Um, I don't think it means women to a woman. Yeah, yeah. But could you just say a comment or two about them and their work? Well, sure. Um, Janet Gould um, and Margaret Benson did become very close friends. Uh, some people felt that they were more than that, that they actually had a relationship, but I don't think we know that with certainty. Um, but um, uh, Margaret Benson came from a family of highly connected to uh, the English Anglican uh, uh, church. Um, her family was concerned about her. Her health was not great, but she managed to get through a couple of seasons. I think Janet, truthfully, 
probably was much more of the real excavator um, of the temple, but they managed uh, to produce uh, a wonderful volume, the Temple of Mood, uh, Mood at Asher, um, which we all still use, uh, Richard Fazzini, and uh, it's a Bible, and Richard Fazzini actually owns Janet Gourlay's personal copy, so that, that's a bit <laughs> of envy. Um, and, uh, uh, but they, uh, they, they were able to excavate three for three seasons. Um, and uh, they were the ones who found all this statuary that, that you see people representing, uh, huge numbers, because they found these wonderful uh, uh, ca caches that had been buried next to the temple. Um, and uh, all of that material has been in the Egyptian museums for well over 100 years now. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you mentioned Richard Fazzini. For those who don't know, he's Brooklyn Museum again. But also many years ago, we had a program on art and archaeology and the movies, because we all we don't want to get our history from the films. And I had a wonderful program that Richard participated in about the Ten Commandments. Mm. He was part of it as was the son of Yul Brenner, who was there when the movie was shot. Oh, wonderful. He spoke about wearing the helmet and how heavy it was. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it wasn't online, the whole program, but it was wonderful. Uh, there was a question from the committee, and that's Margaret, and there was an online question that related um, whether Hatchet's interest in rehabilitating the te Temple of Mud had to do with they're both being wives of Amun. And someone asked a question, what does it mean to be God's wife? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's very hard to say with real certainty, um, I think, mm -hmm. what her intent was here in, in redoing things. Um, and I, I admit that at the Moot Temple, it's one of the things we're still struggling with because um, those limestone shrines that she put up were were real co-regency monuments. So it wasn't the same intention that she had at Karnak, where she was removing a period of her looking like a queen mm -hmm. um, and replacing it with her being a true ruler king, mm -hmm. um, as she did uh, at Karnak. Um, it it's it's it just may be fashion uh, as much as anything else, and there is right at that moment a complete switchover um, from using limestone to using sandstone as the temple building material, um, and so it's quite possible that she was just you know jazzing it up uh, to make it uh, to, to complete it better. Now, in terms of um, her role as the God's wife of Amun. Um, this is a very, very high priestly office, but it was only created um, in the time before her at the beginning of the 18th dynasty by King Ahmos for his sister uh, and wife, Ahmos Nefertari. Mm -hmm. And um, the God's wife of Amun had uh, ultimately was in the time of Hatshepsut at least, if we go by the quartzite red chapel, um, the God's wife is every bit as important as the high priest. Uh, you see them actually sharing activities together. Uh, they go down into the sacred lake uh, to bathe. Uh, they burn the, the, uh, the enemies of the God together. Um, they are sort of calling the God uh, to come to eat uh, uh, at the beginning and during, throughout the day um, together. So this is a very important role. Now there should have been also theoretically a, an element in which the gendered aspect of the God's wife um, had to do with his creation by means of masturbation. And it has been proposed that the God's wife of Amun actually would do that uh, for the statue of the God. Um, and, you know, to what extent these mythological ritual elements 
had a true existence and in what way yeah. is very hard for us to reconstruct. I mean, we can we can think about it and we can opine that that's mythologically the role, um, but how it actually operated, uh, it, it's another question altogether because we just don't have that information. Very interesting. Um, there's a lot of erotic art at this time also. <laughs> that's that's yes. not a topic totally. So when you're bringing up the issue of mess. Yeah, I mean, and I don't, I don't want to downplay it. It's, it's more just, you know, we, you know, it is a performative religion. And mm -hmm. so in that sense, it wouldn't be impossible that there would be a context in which it would happen on what though? I mean, <laughs> you know, on a statue on, I, I, you know, I don't know. Yes. Um, you mentioned and the sandstone and limestone at some yeah. point, and you said it again now. I'm going to go back to the committee questions, but some people asked about that. It always seemed to me that limestone is much har harder to carve than sandstone. I don't know if that's accurate. And well, I think it's actually the opposite. On top. Yeah, it's really the opposite way. Limestone, it's because it's a okay. sedimentary rock that's actually chemically produced, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's more homogenous. Okay. And uh, sandstone is a clastic rock. It's a, it, it is just tiny grains of sand that have been pressurized together. And so um, it can be quite grainy and crusty and much more difficult to get a crisp line um, in terms of carving. Mm -hmm. um, and so in fact, that was probably the reason that, one of the reasons that sandstone was not preferred earlier. But limestone doesn't do well at all with water. It mm -hmm. is easily eroded and then you lose the clarity of the carving. Um, and so ultimately they did really switch over to using uh, sandstone as their primary uh, temple material. But as you can see at Daryl Bakri, Hatshepsut was having none of it. She kept limestone because she obviously loved the way it looked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it's one of the pleasures of learning from you, <laughs> which is good. Um, now, we had a question from Jody about the Hatshepsut pro problem that relates to her imagery having been uh, defaced, removed. And were there political uh, reasons above that most the third being furious at her for keeping him in check. It does it relate to the relationship between men and women. And someone asked a question also as a corollary. Could this elimination of Hatshepsut then, and the fact that Thutmose the third was the son of a harem wife, he wanted to trace his lineage directly from Thutmose the first and ignore yeah. anything that got in the way. No, I mean, those are all very, uh, really very interesting uh, and good questions. Um, <clears throat> I, I suspect that um, we really need to bear in mind always when we talk about the removal of Hatshepsut's images mm -hmm. that, <clears throat> that this was late in the five decade reign of Thutmose III. Um, we think it was, after year 42. Um, in fact, we're fairly sure it was after year 42, he had a 54 year reign. Um, now that would imply to most of us mm -hmm. that he had allowed her image to be there uh, for uh, at least two decades um, before bothering with it. And it seems much more likely that it wasn't just anger at the way he had been treated, but it was much more concern about his son, Amenhotep II, would be the mm -hmm. heir, and that there would be no challenges that might have come from adherents of Hatshepsut who would support someone perhaps coming from the Ahmosid line. She has the she, she really has the claim to going back to the beginning of the 18th dynasty that Thutmose III doesn't have. And so the possibility that someone might have been put forward um, who could get in the way of, um, of Amenhotep II's uh, succession 
um, I think is the primary um, mover behind uh, doing the proscription. And it would seem to be supported by the by two other things. One, which is that he actually took his son uh, as a co-regent in the last two years of his reign. Uh, and secondly, the proscription continued under the first years of um, second reign. So this does seem to really have been something that they were doing to just make sure that they were not going to have a contest for who was going to become ruler. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Now, Faye from the committee, this is the last direct committee question, asked about Sunamat and his relationship, and we're not talking about a personal relationship now, mm -hmm. but a political relationship and an artistic relationship. Uh, could you speak to that? Um, is that, that or, so I mean, I, I'm not sure that I understood it entirely, but I, I think that if, um, you know, the probably the very best, um, comments on this um, really came out of um, the Metropolitan Museum's exhibition um, on Hatshepsut and Queen Tefera. I'm holding the catalog up. <laughs> Betsy has written one of the chapters about the Temple of Mud. It was wonderful. Um, and where they really do sort of take on this question of innovation and creativity um, and that Sin and Mood has really been um, uh, attributed with um, that innovative um, uh, um, artistic elements in the reign of At Jefferson, particularly with respect to creating new statue forms um, that he himself then uh, has made of himself. And he has a huge number, as you well know, um, of statues of himself made. And several of them are completely uh, brand new forms. Uh, and um, so we saw one today, the beautiful Hathoric Neophor um, that he has and uh, the kneeling ones where he's holding the rope um, for measuring uh, fields, etc. Um, so I think that one could certainly say that he had great claim uh, to uh, artistic uh, innovation. The problem is, of course, that there's nothing to suggest to us that Senen Moot himself was an artist. He never claimed to be an artist, but I think he was someone who worked clearly very closely with them. And those people um, who did that, and I think Amenhotep son of Hapu is another one who did that, mm -hmm. uh, do end up um, with these remarkable innovations and contributions to the art uh, mm -hmm. overall. Yeah. Someone asked, you mentioned that Senemut is often found hiding in doorways. Could you say a few more words about this? Yeah, well, um, in, inside of uh, Deir al Bahri, um, there are uh, places where, um, uh, again, uh, sort of behind what appears to be a door, there's a, 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 an image of, uh, of Sen and Mut. Um, and and um, he was able to simply insert himself um, because he was acting on behalf of the ruler. Uh, there was no reason for his image to be in the mm -hmm. king's temple, deep in the temple. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet, um, as long as he shows himself uh, uh, worshiping the gods, um, it would have apparently, uh, it was considered uh, okay. But um, I think it's always been interpreted as, hubris on the part of Sen and Moot, um, that frankly, he could do it. And so he did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, entirely different subject. Okay. <laughs> did non-royal ancient Egyptians marry their siblings? Ah, great question. Uh, These are all great questions. I mean, <laughs> audience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we have really nothing to suggest that. Um, so, uh, you know, people look for it. 
uh, all the time. Uh, and we just don't see evidence for non-royal uh, people um, in any kind of routine way or in any way uh, mm -hmm. marrying their siblings. Uh, just, I would say no. But the only reason I stumble over it, just the tiniest bit, is that there is a law code from very, very late mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt's history. And um, in that law code, there's actually a, a, a comment that uh, sister shall not sit down with, his, with her brother. And one wonders if, if, if it wasn't happening, then why would you have to have <laughs> an interdiction for it? So, you know, you, 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 uh, so, so as I say, if from our looking at the prosopography of people or the history and genealogy of the people we can look at, we don't see it happening, but mm -hmm. I always leave all doors open. <laughs> <laughs> Good contact. <laughs> now, this is also a different sort of question. Uh, you mentioned the ostrich fan that would help Hatshepsut uh, have herself asserted as ruler. And I know that the feathers also appear in other images connected with different pharaohs as well. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, you absolutely. That? Yeah, no. That uh, thank you for, for actually for asking that because um, you know Lanny Bell I think was um, one of the people instrumental in getting us to pay more attention uh, to the ostrich fan as um, a a pointer. It's really almost a marker um, for the presence of the royal ka. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was doing it in with respect to the Luxor temple, which he felt uh, in many ways was a temple uh, of the royal Ka. Um, but as you already said, it appears over and over again in pretty much uh, every uh, ruler's uh, material in that in this 18th dynasty time period. You have it for Tutankhamun. You have it uh, on the uh, almost everybody. Um, but here it's pretty clearly connected to the presence of a sort of new form of Hatshepsut developing her persona as, uh, as a ruler, where she's still only taking one cartouche, Matka Re. She's not mm -hmm. calling herself King of Upper and Lower Egypt, Matka Re, son of Re, mm -hmm. Hatshepsut yet. She's only choosing one. But that royal fan nearby is a is like waving a little flag to say, you know, here this is the the coming ruler. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to ask one more joint question. There are so many fabulous questions that I received. It's only that the club has another program. I know. I know. On this has to get off, and this is so. Betsy, we will have you back again. I can't say when. <laughs> but so reinvited, okay. And incidentally, Lanny Bell, we say the late great Lanny Bell, spoke about mummies and sexuality. It would have been oh. perfect oh, yeah. for this topic. Also, um, people asked about linens and oils being depicted, and how do you know? Then what's been removed, such as the cartouche, the prenomen? of Hatshepsut. How do you know that it contained her name actually? Is it by context, by uh, what's surrounding yeah. it? So, um, um, so in most of these cases, it, you know, if you're very careful doing epigraphy, in most of these cases, you find the traces um, mm -hmm. of, uh, of certain elements of, of the hieroglyphs and um, and it's not nearly as mysterious uh, as it would seem. Another thing that you that you see happening um, is even when the Egyptians would take a statue and redo the face to change the face into someone else, it, it's always evident by the change in the surface. Um, and um, and so there, you know, that's what Egyptologists are very much trained to be on the lookout for uh, is, is well, this name is a little oddball looking, let's take a closer look. And when you do, you almost always find the surface can be very different. Like with Akhenaten, they would carve back, you know, they would mutilate everything. And then in order to restore it, 
uh, to put Moot's image back after Akhenaten's people, they would cut back the whole stone surface. Mm -hmm. So the god, uh, I mean, the, the king standing next to her would be considerably forward of where the image of the goddess is because they just swiped it away and then recarved. So these things, when you see them in person, are really quite easy to tell. It doesn't, unfortunately, work as well uh, on a, uh, on a uh, PowerPoint image. And I think Ignatin himself um, removed some of the mentions of Hatshepsut as well. Oh. So it goes oh. in the direction, <laughs> yeah. fortunately. Um, but the other question was about representations of oil and linen. Yeah. So uh, are these not, very clearly depicted? Oh, um, yes, and they're uh, they're labeled. Uh, so they're also, um, you know, the Egyptians were nothing if not uh, repetitive. So <laughs> they would have an icon that stood for uh, a box of linen, and that icon is almost you don't even need the inscription because you just see that it's an icon that represents what we well known by the detailed inscriptions contains linens of different colors. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether it's unguents and oils or whether it's linens, um, we have both enormous amounts of examples that identify them. And then we also have this sort of repetitive iconic way of doing Egyptian art that makes it such that it, it's likely not to be a, a difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about linen, I had a friend, I had worked at the Met, but it was in the Lehman collection. And I had a friend who was the conservator of Mekhedra's tomb that the, yeah. we have at the Met and she worked on the linen. Mm. And, and she said that um, some of it had been read and she was given some linen as a gift. And <laughs> she let me touch it. It was the most amazing thing. I probably brought my feelings about Egyptian art. There was static electricity. I never <laughs> knew what it was. I used to tell that to my classes in Egyptian art. Yeah, um, right. But this has been an electric talk. So let me end on that note. And thank you. You've, I think, certainly highlighted an important part. You've stimulated interest. And if it seems from the question, everyone wants to know more. And we look forward to your continuing and the, all the publications that are gonna be coming out. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> I've enjoyed it very much. And I know you're gonna have a wonderful next presentation too. So, so thank, <laughs> thank you. you all. Okay. okay, goodbye. And thank you for joining me most of all, Betsy, my heartfelt thanks. This has been thanks. wonderful. Thanks.